What's up you guys, my name is RBG and welcome to another update slash analysis video regarding Transformers The Last Night. And man, let me just say that this is looking like it could be the definitive Transformers film the community has been asking for. I mean, we knew Paramount and Hasbro were serious about changing up the infrastructure with the aid of the new writers room, but we were still a little skeptical based on the earlier trailers we've seen. But as we gradually got more news and some of the later trailers and TV spots, fans are beginning to see the fruits of the new writers team's labor. And of course, it wouldn't be right if we didn't give kudos to the one manning the directing helm, Michael Bay. I have my complaints about the insufferable humor and human components he tries to incorporate into Transformers movies and how they seem to be taking steps backward, but the overall scope and visuals have progressively gotten better in a way that provokes other directors to step their game up. You can literally feel Bay's ambition as he moves forward in each sequel. I first noticed this around the time Revenge of the Fallen was released. The movie is considered one of the worst in the TF movie franchise, hell arguably the worst film of all time, but underneath the cracks of all its flaws it lied some excellent visually stunning action sequences that still hold up to this day. Inspired by its use in Christopher Nolan's Batman The Dark Knight film, three action sequences in Revenge of the Fallen were shot using IMAX cameras. All those sequences were perfectly shot scenes that showcased how visually ambitious the film was even though it lacked that narrative thrust from the writers. This is why I respect these films so much. No matter how bad those IMAX tickets burn a hole in my wallet, I still get a bang for my buck because if we're gonna be honest, when we go into an IMAX movie, we want the visuals to be pleasing to our optics. We want that visual fidelity. With that said, Michael Bay did a recent behind the scenes video sharing his view on the IMAX cinema experience and how he's here to keep the 3D alive. He talks about how he believes films should be seen using the finest technology from cameras, projection technology, sound technology, etc. He stated that this would be the first film to be shot in native IMAX 3D this year. Now what he means by native 3D is that it's basically a film that's shot in real 3D as opposed to most films that are shot in 2D and receive a 3D transfer. Not to badmouth 3D transfers because some of them turn out good if handled properly but most are half done and are just used for a quick cash grab. If I remember correctly, during the time Revenge of the Fallen was being worked on, Bay stated that he found 3D too gimmicky. So it's kind of funny that he's pulling out all the stops to make this the best IMAX 3D experience. This time around, he has this setup where two cameras were rigged on top of each other, one being the standard IMAX camera and the other being a stereoscopic IMAX camera to give off a super high resolution with depth perception. Now as a YouTuber who's very knowledgeable about bit rates, I can honestly say that I noticed the difference the new camera made just looking at the recent trailers that were uploaded on Transformers The Last Night and Paramount Pictures YouTube channels. YouTube has a way of sort of robbing videos of its true HD quality because they compress the shit out of our videos, but the visuals in this film are so good that they still manage to shine through in each trailer. I actually got a chance to see the 25 minutes of IMAX footage last week, and I have to say that based on what I've seen, this is the best looking film I've seen in years. I didn't want to make a video just talking about the footage since I knew a trailer would be coming out the following week, so I thought it would be better to mention it once we got more trailers and leaks. The actual 3D featurette where Michael Bay talked about how he filmed the movie was presented in the theaters a couple days before it was uploaded onto YouTube, but only half of that segment was uploaded. In the 25 minutes of IMAX footage, it cut back to Bay saying that the CG footage is still being worked on and based on the trailers it shows, as you can see by the footage in this video, it's not necessarily bad as you can see. The only issue that I find myself having, which I've had with all the previous films, would be the constant switching of aspect ratios because it goes from widescreen to IMAX full screen. But with all that said, I want to talk about the 22 second upload we got on April the 6th entitled Micro Feast, which was basically a video consisting of documented micro photograph pictures of Transformers working alongside humans from different time periods. Now I think a lot of viewers were getting things confused in this video because it featured old pictures of robots who looked similar to the ones we've seen in modern day like Starscream, Bumblebee, Ironhide, Drift, and Hound. But I can assure you that it's not necessarily the case. I believe this clip was meant to show the different generational Transformers who had contact with Earthlings before the main Autobots arrived. Let's keep in mind that there are Transformers who come from different tribes such as the Thetacons which Ironhide came from. And from those different tribes comes different protoforms which are basically the different skeletal systems that make up each Transformers race. So the robots that we see in this trailer aren't actually the ones we come to know but they could possibly be their ancestors. Now I mentioned in my Origins of Orion Pax video that TF5 would possibly be incorporating the conspiracies that past historical groups such as the Nazis received help by people from other worlds. 
I also talked about the German Nazi secret wonder weapon the Glocka and how it could possess the power of time travel. A lot of viewers agreed with my theory and some thought I was reaching too hard with this speculation. I won't talk about it too much in this video but if you're interested in the full theory I'll leave a link to that video. It looks like I wasn't too far off on my theory. I mean we sorta of knew that we would be jumping back and forth through history regarding the medieval knights of the Arthurian period with some brief hints of the World War II period but we didn't think that there would be transformers roaming the earth in different cultures and history. The running theme for the Microfeast trailer says and I quote, behind every battle, behind every victory lies a secret, rethink the past. What I think this trailer is trying to illustrate is that the humans shouldn't believe that they created their culture and weaponry on their own, because we may have been influenced by visitors or transformers who could possibly influence each culture. As I mentioned earlier, conspiracists believe that the Nazis received help with their technological advancements, but what's not to say that it's not only the weapons and technology but the culture as well. As you can see by this mini clip, there are transformers wearing armor from the different time periods in history. For instance, in this photo we see Autobots who look similar to Drift and they're in a photo wearing Japanese samurai armor which could possibly date back to the 4th century. We even see a robot who has the same build as Starscream working alongside the Germans to help further their development with planes. But I don't think this Transformer is necessarily Starscream himself, as we all know Transformers have shared similar body types in layman's terms, remolds. It's kinda ironic that one of the first remolds or recolors in Transformers history was actually based from Starscream which consisted of his secret units Thundercracker and Skywarp. So let's just keep that in mind before we completely jump the gun. If we're gonna be logical about this, Starscream actually made his way to Earth around the time the Beagle 2 rover was launched on Mars and that was in late 2003. So I don't think that was him aiding the German Nazis on their planes. What I'm guessing is that Transformers have been scattered across the globe for centuries and have shared different cultures as well as embraced different subcultures. This brings me to Optimus Prime's overall knightly aesthetic because there's a possibility that he could be partially related to the group of knights we've seen in the recently released trailer 3, which I'm now gonna segue into. If you remember back in Age of Extinction, Optimus Prime went into a upgrade overhaul with his design. As much as it was explained through Lockdown's exposition on how Optimus belonged to the Knights Crusaders and the Knights Temenos, that bit of information was a little on the nose. Thankfully the new writers room took it upon themselves to do their due diligence and find a way to set up new story elements for future films while explaining the old ones from previous films because let's be honest, Michael Bay isn't one to elaborate on past instances let alone expand upon them. No explanations on sudden Autobots disappearances, no nothing. But judging from all the trailers we are going to be getting plot devices from past films that may have been glossed over. Plot devices such as the Ark, Lockdown Ship and Cybertron from the aftermath of its destruction after Dark of the Moon, and now a full-fledged explanation behind the Knights Crusaders and their ties to Optimus Prime. As I mentioned earlier, we get a general idea of what's going on on what we saw from the third trailer. During this trailer, we got a narration presented by Sarah Anthony Hopkins character Edmund Burton, similar to the one we got in the first reveal trailer. Now right off the bat, I noticed that the scenery at the beginning of trailer 3 looks very similar to the one we've seen in the first reveal trailer. This may in fact be a direct continuation where we left off, like where we see this mystery human knight riding down the fields of England, being accompanied by the three-headed dragon who was later confirmed to be the Autobot Dragonstorm. Now many including myself assume Dragonstorm could be following or leading the knight to some specific location of importance. In the newest trailer we spot the mystery knight come upon this cave in which if you look closely it looks like an old Cybertronian ship that crash landed from yesteryears. I'm gonna go ahead and speculate that this mystery person is Merlin and somehow he stumbled onto the ancient Cybertronian technology from the ship thanks in part to Dragonstorm. Because in the 25 minutes of IMAX footage I've seen there was this big medieval battle and King Arthur who's being played by British actor Liam Garrigan was looking for the magician known as Merlin. Now what I found interesting about this specific scene was the weaponry the Arthurian knights were using against their enemies. There were these catapults infused with Cybertronian technology oddly enough. Which leads me to believe that King Arthur and his knights forged some kind of pact or alliance with the group of Transformers or the Knight Crusaders. And that brings us to the next scene in the trailer which showcases the Arthurian knights celebrating around the round table but they seem to be sharing their celebration with Cybertronian knights. After witnessing this in the IMAX footage I think it's safe to say that I was correct in my assumption in my previous videos and that is that the Knights of Old possibly forced a pact of some kind of agreements with the Transformers. If you guys recall I did a video in which I speculated that the item that was gifted to the Knights could be the Omega Key which wields the ability to tap into the Omega Lock's power. 
I thought of this because we keep seeing this huge metallic platform featured in pretty much all the trailers and in most of the TF mythos I've seen and read. The Omega Lock has always been the end all be all device to restore Cybertron. Just what if the Cybertronian Knights gifted the Human Knights with their technology in exchange for a contingency plan which involves storing the Omega Lock on Earth to later be utilized to save Cybertron? I mean in most versions of the TF mythology, the Earth has always been the go-to planet for the Cybertronians due to its sufficient supply of energon. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that the Transformers we've seen align themselves with these humans or Autobots because in most cases they wouldn't dare tamper with or invoke their rule over a planet that already has pre-existing life forms. I'm guessing that since both humans and Cybertronian Knights were at their most prominent, they probably never thought they would see the day where both their planets would collide in an all-out battle of survival. Keep in mind that these are just my speculations, so calm your testosterone juices of excitement and refrain from stating this as confirmed info on various forums and YouTube channels. But anyways, back on the subject of the Omega Lock, or the particular gigantic item that we keep seeing emerge from the water in various trailers. I think we may have seen a full glimpse of what the Omega Lock looks like from various pictures, mainly from the first promotional poster we got back last August on Times Square billboards. If you notice, this just isn't a poster showcasing the Optimus and Dragonstorm, but it's also showing off some of the various plot elements that lead up to some of the climactic events in the film. The one I want to single out is this weird looking spike with the circular platform at the top. I have reason to believe that this is the same object we see Optimus and Bumblebee fighting on top of in all the recent trailers. This mystery artifact could be the leading factor in Cybertron's reincarnation and is possibly a part of the Knight's pact with the humans. After analyzing this, things only became more clear with Anthony Hopkins' narration. Things like how this whole ordeal started as a legend, and how they kept the secret hidden for thousands of years to protect Earth from what was destined to arrive. This brings me to the next topic at hand, and that revolves around Cade Yeager and Vivian Wimbley, and the person explaining the origin of the Knights, Sir Edmund Burton himself. Essentially, I thought this narration was just to give us, the viewers, a gist of the movie's plot, but in actuality, Edmund Burton was talking to Cade and Vivian, because they are supposedly the chosen ones who are destined to save the Earth from its prophesied destruction. During the sneak peek IMAX footage, it started off with this intense scene which the Transformers Reaction Force, or TRF, sent out an onslaught of drones to hunt down the Autobots shortly after discovering Cade's whereabouts. Right off jump, you can tell that this is a more experienced version of Cade himself. Not sure how many years this film takes place from Age of Extinction, but visually I could tell enough time has passed that he's not as quick on his feet as he used to be in the previous film, but nonetheless we see that Cade hasn't been slacking on his craft regarding being a mechanic, as we see in various trailers that he's somewhat master Cybertronian weaponry in which we see him use in some scenes involving TRF bipedal drones. Fast forward and we're introduced to the sociopathic headmaster Cogman, whom I've had to admit I was very weary about because Michael Bay's weird characters tend to annoy me, but I found Cogman to be one of the funniest and best aspects of the IMAX footage. He's like a tiny badass version of C-3PO and a lot crazier, but anyways he meets up with Cade, Yeager, Izzy, and Desi to relay some information but before he can do so, they find themselves under the attack of one of the TRF drones. One of the drones knocks Cade out of an elevator window but he's rescued by Crosshair and Bumblebee. Shortly after that, Cogman informs Cade that he's needed in England and proceeds to give Cade an ancient artifact that somehow transfuses with his arm. Now I originally intended to mention this in a speculation video I did back when the Super Bowl TV spots were released. During the battle between Optimus Prime and Bumblebee, if you look really hard, you notice something weird going on with Cade's arm underneath his tattered shirt. I thought it was nothing more than a color error, but it looks like his left arm is covered in some kind of metallic alloy to grant him a significant boost in strength. It would make sense because this is the only way I can see him holding his own against Optimus Prime. This also explains his importance in this battle to save the Earth and how he could possibly be a descendant of the Arthurian Knights. If you think about it, maybe this is why Cade was able to use one of the Cybertronian Knight blasters from the Temenos in Lockdown's ship in Age of Extinction. I find it funny that he was actually able to block off an attack from Lockdown himself given that he's only a human. So what's not to say that he utilized a bit of his inherited knightly powers? but I could just be thinking too hard about it. Anyways, Cogman, Cade, and Bumblebee make their way up to England to meet Sir Edmund Burton, and they're met with some harsh welcoming. I won't spoil it for you, but let's just say the scene involves a certain Transformer who suffers from quote-unquote robot dementia. Shortly after we get our first on-screen introduction to Bumblebee's brother-in-arms, Hot Rod, he was sent on a similar mission to retrieve a human who has special connections to the R3 and Knights herself. And who does this character turn out to be? None other than our secondary protagonist, Vivian Wembley. 
She's said to be an Oxford professor of English literature whom just like Kate seems to be harboring a genetic secret that could potentially destroy or save the world. And similar to Kate having a guardian via Bumblebee, she also has a protector under the watchful optics of Hot Rod who's supposedly been watching over her family for years. If you recall in my second roster update video I shared details on how Hot Rod would have two alt modes, one being the 2017 Lamborghini and the other one being the 1963 Sheetron DS. I originally assumed that the Sheetron would be his first vehicle evasion alt mode and partially I'm correct on that assumption. It's his first alt mode and it just so happens to be Vivian's father's car and she says it's special to her because of those particular reasons but she had no idea that her father's car was actually a robot in disguise who has been sent to protect her. Since I've already given a bit of the scenes details out I won't spoil what unfolds. I'll just say it's a pretty funny moment. Fast forward and Sir Edmund Burton takes Cade and Vivian into a secret room where he goes into further details explaining why they've been chosen. It's basically a flashback regarding the Knights of the Round Table and some of that narration I mentioned earlier about the secret between the humans and the Transformers. What I found interesting during this scene was how the line, without sacrifice there can be no victory because we essentially know that it's a direct callback to the Witwickies from the first three film installments. But what gave the famous quote more meaning and I raised this question in the back of my mind and that is what if Sam Witwicky was a descendant of these legendary knights as well. I mean he's adopted the no sacrifice no victory quote and Bumblebee ended up being his guardian over the course of three years before departing with him and fighting alongside Cade Yeager. But since we're on the topic of Bumblebee, Edmund Burton alludes to the fact that him and B used to be close friends with B possibly being his former guardian. But Bumblebee seems to have no recollection of this and doesn't really know who Burton is. It was from this moment that made me realize how much the new writer's room was invested on explaining the origins of the Transformers. It seems to have so much passion behind it. I mean sure the stupid college frat boy humor of Michael Bay still lingers but this doesn't feel like the earlier installments. The story feels more fleshed out. And I'm just gonna go ahead and speculate that these humans who have been aligned with the Transformers are in some way power masters. Just seeing how Cade Yaker specializes in Cybertronian weaponry and this newfound ability to fuse with Transformia metal reminds me of the Nebulons. Just think about it. Wouldn't it be cool if they featured some kind of binary bondage which involves a Earthling or in this case Cade Yeager transform into a weapon for Bumblebee? I mean we already have the introduction of Cogman who's a headmaster. I mean the headmasters are also known for binary bonding as well. It would be smart to integrate that in since this movie is borrowing from all the Transformers mythos but we'll just have to wait and see. But moving on we get the most anticipated scene regarding Optimus Prime going to meet his creator in what looks to be some kind of dark chamber which we've gotten bits and pieces of in various trailers and we hear the mysterious voice of a woman who's confirmed to be Quintessa. We didn't get a chance to see what she looked like in the IMAX footage but I think the third trailer picks up right after that scene where we get our first on screen visuals of what she looks like. She basically informs Optimus that he destroyed Cybertron and asks him if he seeks redemption. Now I pretty much had a good idea of what Quintessa would look like because she was already unveiled weeks prior on the back of Infernicus's toy box but I know a lot of you were still uncertain if it was actually her or not. But judging by this trailer I think it's safe to say that that is in fact Quintessa in all her CGI glory. And let me just say that this is a beautiful shot, like I know we've gotten fully CG scenes before such as the one we saw on the Nemesis with Megatron in the Fallen and then Lockdown ship, but this one has that sense of nuance and mystery. I mean this is the home planet of the Quintessons we're talking about here. Now originally Quintessa was the actual planet of the Quintesson so I don't know if the planet will share her name or not. I'm not even sure if she's the creator of her own race because in most parts of the TF mythos it was actually Quintus Prime who was the 10th out of the original 13 Primes and they were created by the great Primus himself. But Quintus Prime was actually a dude so I doubt that's the case but I do think they drew inspiration from his design when it came to creating the overall look of Quintessa in this film since she has these weird tentacle legs and they're similar to Quintus's. But anyway somehow Optimus Prime has ended up in bondage and Quintessa seizes control over his spark. I've been guessing that she was easily able to take control over Optimus based on his guilt and conviction to save his home world and that red strip of coloring going down his face could mean that he's been marked as one of the robots who will do Quintessa's bidding. As most fans notice Megatron also bears this weird red mark on the opposite side of his face but he seems to be acting on his own free will. 
I predicted in my last video that it could be because he has no spark to be controlled. If you remember, the new body of Galvatron was being controlled by Megatron's chromosomes and Optimus implied that he had no soul, hence the hole in his chest. And for those of you who keep asking what happened to Galvatron, him and Megatron are literally the same entity. But if you can't take my word for it, then I guess it's best that I let Brains explain it for you. They hooked me up to Megatron and that mind wasn't as dead as they thought. He fed him the science and specs. Also, they could build him a brand new body. Then he infected it with his evil nasty chromosome. KSI might have named the body the snappy name of Galvatron, but that's just Megatron reincarnated. So hopefully this answers your question and you can stop asking. Moving along, we see Cade and Vivian in a room that looks similar to the Knights Timinos, which was the inner sanctum of Lockdown's ship where most of the Knights Crusaders kept their weapons. I guess this was the same location, but I since have changed my mind on that assumption because this room looks a lot bigger. This could possibly be part of that underwater Cybertronian lair, which I'm assuming is the Omega Lock I mentioned earlier. We see this particular setting a lot in the latest trailer. Like in this scene where we see Cade, Vivian, and Optimus and whom I'm assuming to be Megatron sliding down the lair in which I'm guessing was activated shortly before it emerged from the water. I'm saying it has to be Megatron because we spot him and Optimus duking it out in a similar setting that probably took place before the room started to shift. There's another moment where Optimus Prime talks to Vivian Wembley and he says and I quote, For my world to live, your world must die as his eyes start to glow purple. Now it looks like throughout all these moments Optimus Prime is under the control of Quintessa because his eyes are purple in all the scenes even in his battle with Megatron. Moving on I would like to talk about all the chaos that takes place outside the mystery underwater lair because we get some more action sequences that I think the visual effects team may have tweaked a little more compared to the 25 minutes of IMAX footage. There wasn't really much to go by regarding this epic battle between the humans and Cybertron, but if you notice, they've added more of these Cybertronian aerial fighters that look similar to the one that Crosshair and Bumblebee stole from Lockdown's ship in Age of Extinction. I don't believe those were featured in any of the earlier trailers, but it looks like they're going to be involved in the fight as well. And if you look closely, you'll notice that Hot Rod is actually piloting one of them. You can tell it's him based off his black and red color scheme and the wing-like Lamborghini doors protruding from his back. Now I'm just gonna say this, among all the chaos that I've seen so far, Optimus Prime has hands down the most beautiful yet scary action sequences that will probably prove frightening to kids as well as adults who grew up watching our beloved Autobot leader. I mean think about it, he already has one of, if not the highest kill counts in all the films including the ruthless kills of his two fellow Primes being the Fallen and Sentinel, but now that all that ruthlessness has shifted towards anyone who opposes his mission to restore Cybertron, it's most likely going to add a sense of urgency and it's going to scare some of the little ones who go in watching this film. I feel like I'm going to be on the edge of my seat as characters such as Bumblebee have to protect themselves from getting completely wrecked by Shadow Spark Optimus. We basically get more scenes between those two where Optimus pulls out another wrestling move in the form of a gnarly backbreaker. I know a lot of fans are still assuming that B will die at the hands of Optimus since this time we see him getting his iconic wings ripped off his back, which I have to say, finally we see something like that. But I don't think he's going to die just yet considering he's like the mascot of the film series and as mentioned earlier he seems to have some deep rooted history with the Knights and this could possibly be expanded upon in his solo spin-off film that's slated to be released next year in June. There's even a possibility that he could be the new Prime that Michael Bay and his producer have mentioned. Fast forward and we see another Optimus Prime sequence in where we see him get thrown from the claws of Dragonstorm. I originally commented on the trailer that it looks like Optimus may have been riding on the three-headed dragon, but after rewatching this scene again, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I mean, if Dragonstorm was going to give Optimus a lift, I don't think he would sling our red and blue bot like a useless CPU and try to stomp him in the nuts. So I'm going to go ahead and speculate that there will be a throwdown between those two, but I'm not sure why. If anything, I'm wondering if Dragonstorm has been hiding all this time waiting for the foreseen prophecy to unfold or if somehow he time traveled to the present time. The last scene I want to talk about is the one that involves Optimus performing this 360 decapitation slash to these weird looking Transformers at the end of the trailer. Many assume that these were nothing more than carbon copy Decepticons who got their heads cut off, but they're actually the Infernicons I mentioned in my previous roster update video. But here's the catch, I believe we only saw one of them. If you look on the box of the Infernicus toy, it was most likely the Infernicon Skulk or multiple copies of him. I say this because the other Infernicons have different head shapes and Skulk seems to be the only one of the group who has horns similar to the ones we see getting slaughtered by Optimus in this trailer. 
I have a feeling that Michael Bay wanted to give us a tiny glimpse of what these particular Transformers would look like in motion on the big screen. But anyway, Skulk and the rest of the Infernocons are said to combine and form Infernicus, who's supposed to be the guardian of Quintessa. But I'm kind of scratching my head and wondering why Skulk would pick a fight with Optimus Prime if they're both fighting for her. Because in that scene his eyes are still purple so I'm guessing he's under the control of Quintesso so why would he slaughter someone who could potentially be on the same side as him? My guess is that he's possibly trying to fight against his maker's mind control. But that's pretty much all the info I have for you guys today and I apologize if I kept you waiting too long for this analogy slash breakdown video for the recent trailer. But let me know what you think in the comment section below because at the end of the day it's you guys who bring the attention to the videos. As always I ask that you like or dislike the video. It doesn't have to be a thumbs up, it can be a thumbs down. Any feedback is good feedback and will only help me improve on future uploads. And if you're new to the channel and you want to receive more updates regarding Transformers The Last Night or Transformers videos in general, subscribe and hit that notification button. We're at 220k subscribers and I'm hoping we can build our army up to 300k before this year is over with. And to get a confirmation that you guys watched this video in its entirety, follow your comments up with hashtag till all gamers are one. But anyways, this is your boy RBG signing out on another video. I will catch you guys later. Peace out.